They flash both. And uh, Potato finished off Meaty One. And Kraken leaving Darude in the 1v2. And he oh, can't no, do it as he takes out Darude as well. Big, getting all oh, three on man. that it's no secret that I spend a lot of time playing VR games. That said, it may be surprising to some that I've gone several months without playing a normal PC game aside from just making PC games. Instead, I mostly play VR games and that's been the case for several years. I had dabbled a bit in VR game development with Godot, but I generally prefer working with Python and Pygame, and as a result, my 2D game designs are inspired by older games I played before I got into VR in 2018. In fact, I just released a game, Yanok, which is mostly just a mashup of Risk of Rain 1, Enter the Gungeon, and Cellular Automata, which you can check out on Steam right now. But Steam thinks it's similar to Vampire Survivors even though I've never played it, which is rather infuriating. When people make games without an engine, it's common to use OpenGL, short for Open Graphics Library, to handle their rendering pipelines. Similarly, there's a technology that acts as a standardized layer between XR devices and regular software called OpenXR. Recently I got to thinking, I wonder if anybody has set up the Python bindings for OpenXR. While there wouldn't be that many use cases for the average Python user, it seemed like it had been long enough for someone to have done it. After all, OpenXR was released over five years ago. I did a quick Google search and guess what, PyOpenXR is in fact a thing that exists. It's actually been out for three years. With only about 100 stars on GitHub and a handful of contributors, it was apparent that PyOpenXR wasn't a very mature module. Even with the risks, I decided I'd give it a go. Spoiler alert, it works and it's awesome. Step one is to figure out how to even use it. OpenXR itself just allows you to work with XR devices. It doesn't handle rendering itself, so I have to use other libraries to handle the whole graphics part. Viewers of this channel might be thinking that I'm about to shove Pygame in. While this would be extra funny and technically feasible, I opted to use Modern GL for the rendering. Modern GL doesn't provide a window or input handling though, so I had to get that from somewhere else too. The examples in the PyOpenXR repository use PyOpenGL for rendering and GLFW for the window. Since PyOpenXR provided most of the boilerplate if I used GLFW for my window, I decided to use GLFW as well. It would be nicer to use Pygame for the window, but it would have also taken more work to set up with PyOpenXR. So I hacked up the example program, shoved modern gel in, and voila, a working VR demo. Wait, uh, there's no window mirroring the display to my desktop, it's just in my headset. Since PyOpenXR's GLFW boilerplate is inside PyOpenXR's code, I have to do a little hack to get myself a window so I can record. Now you can see better. Isn't this nice? Unfortunately, another problem has appeared. There appears to be a memory leak. Funny enough, the memory leak is coming from PyOpenXR. The core loop for updating the headset's displays does in fact have a memory leak in it. I did some digging through the PyOpenXR source code, found the leak, and submitted a pull request with the fix. Surprisingly, it got merged in, so now I'm one of the five PyOpenXR contributors. With all the basics now properly functioning, I could advance on to make something more game-like. Here's a simple idea. Pavlov, but with cubes because I don't want to deal with physics right now. Basic netcode can be pretty simple, especially with my networking framework. So first things first, the player needs a body. Not a 3D model type of body, I mean a physical virtual thingy-majig body. A lot of techniques I use in 2D game development apply to 3D game development. If I want to move the camera, or in this example the player, I need to move everything else in the world since there is no camera when you're coding stuff from scratch. Although one notable difference here is that the GPU is moving the world instead of the CPU like the way it works in my 2D games. Also it's 3D which not only means more dimensions, but it also means rotations. Several hours of quaternion and linear algebra shenanigans later, I have the ability to move, turn, and have objects track my hands based on the combination of real-life movement from OpenXR and virtual movement in the game's world. The next step is to add the cubes. This is quite easy since I can just rip the voxel code out of my other project and shove it in this project. They're both modern GL after all. Now I'll throw in some original artwork and I've got myself a Minecraft looking VR game that still lacks physics. Cube physics is surprisingly simple. If you've seen my video on 2D physics, the algorithm works for any number of dimensions for shapes where all the corners are perpendicular. I added the third dimension and boom, Minecraft physics. 
Time to pull out Block Bench so I can give myself a gun. After all, guns in Pixel Art are a certified the Fluffy Potato Classic. After even more Quaternion and Linear Algebra shenanigans, I was able to set up a reusable VR item system that can handle transformations with different interaction and grip points. Making a gun aim based on where your real life hands are takes a surprising amount of work. Part of the complication is that you can't just point the gun at the angle of the hands because the grip points may not be axis aligned. I don't even want to talk about the angular velocity when throwing things. Compared to the math associated with holding things with two hands, Bullets and particle effects were an absolute breeze to implement. The final actually difficult challenge necessary for this type of game is weapon recoil. My VR item system was already pretty complicated, at least with my lack of 3D experience, and adding another adjustment to the transformation logic just compounded things. The idea is to just offset the weapon rotation relative to the primary hand pivot. With recoil mixed in, my transformation logic is now a bit of a mess. It's of course worth it though, because now I can look like an idiot by dual wielding ARs with insane recoil. In order to make this more of a game than a tech demo, I need something to shoot. I did a little modeling, a little short term focused hackery, and some questionable bullet physics, and ta-da! I can now shoot this NPC. It doesn't feel very meaty though, so it's about time to add some spatial audio. My PyOpen XR, GLFW, and modern GL tech stack doesn't have support for audio anywhere, so I had to grab something else. I heard about OpenAL, the audio equivalent of OpenXR or OpenGL, and decided to use it for the audio. It has more features for spatial audio than something like Pygame. It's not too difficult to use, but the documentation is sorely lacking on the Python end. After plugging in the world coordinates and orientation of the player's head and various noise making things, I have actual game audio. I intentionally made the media hit sound play from all locations instead of placing it in the world. While it would be nice to make use of the spatial system more, I feel it's good game design to have hit sounds clearly audible regardless of distance so that shots feel meatier. As of now, my little game is a bit empty. I think it's an appropriate time to spruce things up, with some literal spruce. I already have a system for just rendering normal 3D models in the world however I'd like, but there can be a lot of foliage in a scene and unfortunately, Python really chugs if I try to compute transformations on that many objects. Similar to how you can group cubes into a single chunk mesh, I decided to group similar decor objects into a decor mesh, so that I can significantly reduce the number of transformation calculations done by Python. The shader I wrote for foliage has motion based on the origin of each object though, which gets lost if I merge thousands of grass and tree objects into a single mesh. My solution was to embed the origin of each object into the vertex data when creating the mesh so that the GPU knows where each vertex's object's origin is as they're being transformed. Now my foliage runs beautifully. After being one of the first people to make a VR game from scratch with Python, I think I've earned the right to point out the performance. The game can start up in around a second, while many VR games can take 30 seconds normally. And the game is barely touching my CPU or GPU. Of course, things will slow down if I work on them more, but it's quite nice as a starting point and probably beats most game engines if you were to make the same thing. Time to flex a little on those NPCs I put in my game. So what's next with this project? Well, there's a lot of stuff. I need to add lots of more realistic gunplay mechanics still, the NPCs need to fight back, and who could forget, I need to make it multiplayer. In the meantime, I've just released my 2D game Yannock. If you like that type of game and you want to support my work, you can go check it out on Steam. The Python and Pygame source code is also included in the game files if you want to take a look at that. I'd also like to have a PixCarts playtest before the end of the year, so I'll have to split the burner across a few projects for a while, although with Yannick released, I have way more breathing room now. 
Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.